This is an interview with Mr. Julius A. Maddox from the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's Oral History Project. I'm Dr. Horace Huntley. We're presently at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Today is October 4th, 1996. Mr. Vance, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit and talk with me today about Birmingham and the movement. Welcome to the Institute. Glad to be here. I'd just like to ask a rather general question about your family. Were your mother and father from Birmingham? My mother and father were from Fairfield. Fairfield? Fairfield. They were born in Fairfield? No, my father was born in Lee County and my mother was born in Wilcox County. Okay. And they migrated to uh, Fairfield. To Fairfield, okay. Then you were born here in I was, Fairfield? I was born in Fairfield. Okay. Uh, what about uh, your, your parents' educational background? My mother, she had a high school education. My father had less than a high school education. And uh, of course then, when my mother finished high school, she taught school for a brief period before she moved to Birmingham. Right. High school education at that time was pretty significant. I think, it, I think she finished high school in the 10th grade, Yes, I remember. Did she finish uh, in Lee County? No, in Wilcox County. Wilcox County. Yes. Okay. Uh, what about siblings? How many brothers and sisters? I have one sister. One sister. You the oldest? I'm the oldest. Oh, okay. Um, you grew up in Fairfield. That's correct. Uh, what about elementary school? Did you go to school at in Fairfield as well? Yeah, I attended Inglewood Elementary School from the first through the ninth grade, I believe. Then I graduated from elementary school in ninth grade and went to uh, Fairfield Industrial High. In the 10th grade, and I spent three years of the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Where was Inglewood? Inglewood was a, a steel plant quarter, so to speak. Um, it's no, there's no more Inglewood, just a very small portion of it. There's the uh, duplex houses where. A portion of Fairfield? It was supposedly the slums of Fairfield. I see. Okay, you know, there's an Inglewood now on the north side of Birmingham. Um, so this is. That's, that's interesting that we had in Inglewood and, and Fairfield. What do you remember when you started first grade? Oh yes, I uh, at that time my mother was uh, working, is doing domestic work, and I, of course I went to school with my older cousins, and uh, I, I guess I started school around second, was well, three, three years old, four years old, so I never. I was never in the first grade when I came from school age. They were promoting me already. You were already going, you'd already right. passed that, right. that stage, yes. Uh, you mentioned that your mother did domestic work. Yes. Um, was that a regular job for her? Uh, did she have certain people that she worked for? Certain people that she worked for. My, my father was a coal miner. Okay. And did he work for you at Steel? Yes, he did. Um, well, that would make you guys, uh, at that particular time, you, if he was a coal miner and she was doing work outside of the home as well, uh, you probably would not uh, pull, pull forward. <laughs> well, we didn't know that we were poor. <laughs> that was the beauty of it. Yes. We didn't realize that we were poor. Uh, we seemed out to be a country down in Wilcox County in the summer to visit my grandmother. And of course, uh, I think uh, I learned that you ate three meals a day when I was in the country. I thought you only ate two meals a day. As far as I was concerned, the supper and dinner was the same thing. But when I went to the country, my aunt said, uh, I said something, I said, oh, you're eating again? I said, you eat too much. And, and she asked my uncle, uh, they don't eat twice a day. And I learned then that you still have three meals a day. Mm -hmm. So that was a revelation. That was a revelation. From the country. From the yeah. country. Yes. What do you remember about growing up in Fairfield? Oh, Lord. As I said, uh, when we were growing up, uh, we used to play with the white kids. There was a cornfield across the tar ditch. And we used to play football. I mean, it was very small. What's the tar ditch? That's a ditch that ran through the uh, 
through the uh, neighborhood uh, from the kelp works and these chemicals, tar and stuff, uh, environmental hazards, really what they were. And uh, we used to play football, as I said, we played football with white kids. And, uh, and after we get a certain age, they would make us call the mister. Your friends. Oh, yeah. We had to call them Mr. after so many, after we got so large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that they live on one side of the tar ditch and you live on the yes, other side? They exactly. lived on one side of the tar ditch and you lived on the other. And we had to, uh, when I went to the high school from Inglewood, we had to walk from Inglewood through the white community to the Fairfield Industrial. And I remember. Uh, Professor Oliver would either, he made an arrangement to let us out early or hold us late because the white kids would, would throw rocks at us and, and beat us. Yeah. And so we had to walk right past the high, white high school to get to the black high school. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure that, that created some difficulty. Oh, for us. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, then, back then, you were not allowed to fight with white kids. Right. Yeah. And, uh, were there ever any fight? Did, were they oh, yes. between we used, blacks and whites? We used to fight, but uh, we end up getting the worst end of it because we end up going to jail. Mm -hmm. And you didn't want to go to jail. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fight we would do, we would run. We'd throw a rock and run. Right. Right. Um, in growing up in Fairfield, uh, Fairfield, of course, is probably the most noted for uh, the steel mills, the U.S. steel, but also for being the home of Willie Mays. That's correct. Um, did you know Willie Mays? Oh, yes. Uh, Willie Mays was in, in a class behind me, a year behind me in high school. And uh, I did some tutoring. Uh, Mrs. Averhard used to have me to tutor him in man. I don't know why, because I wasn't that bright. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you were, you were quite a help for him. Oh, yeah. In, in, and we played football together. I see. He played on the. Yeah, yeah we had the. We had the. Uh, you see, the class of 48, 40, 49 was there. Uh, the first class that we never lost a game. We won for one loss and tied for what, something like that. Mm -hmm. we, we never lost a game. That was the first football team that we never lost a game. Mm -hmm. And we were rather proud of that. Yeah. What, what else did you remember that stands out in your mind about Fairfield Industrial High? Oh, Professor Oliver, uh, he was a giant. The principal. Uh, he was principal. And uh, when you finished Fairfield, you knew something. You knew something. I've heard that before. Why do you guys say that? What, what, what was so significant about Fairfield? I don't really know, uh, except that the teachers cared. They cared an awful lot about you. And, uh, they taught, I guess, the discipline, who very disciplined, and uh, and there was no play. There was no room for play. You played when you was on the playground, but you didn't play in class. It was serious business. It was serious yeah. business. Well, after you finished high school, what did you do? When I finished high school, I... Uh, I went to uh, A&M for a half a year in 50, 49 and 50, and then the Korean War broke out in 1950. Mm -hmm. And of course, I couldn't find a job, and I didn't have any money, so I, I volunteered for the Army. I went to the Army in 1950 and stayed in there for three years. What was that transition like from Fairfield to, well, from a and m to the military. It was it was rather dramatic. Um, we are the army then was very segregated, and of course we were called the N word all the time by our superiors. And uh, when we first the first one on in July of 1950, I was in Fort Knox, Kentucky. Of course, we thought we were free then, you know, we were in the army. And we were, we got into a, a race ride, I guess, in, in Louisville, Kentucky. 
And they were so angry with us, they shipped us off to El Paso, Texas, to boot camp. And we stayed down there through boot camp. And uh, I, I truly enjoyed it, too. It was, a, it was an interesting experience. Where did you go from boot camp? Uh, after boot camp, uh, I went to the 29th Signal, and they sent me to Camp Gordon, Georgia. It's now Fort Gordon, but then it's Camp Gordon, Georgia, to pole line construction school. And uh, I learned pole line construction and went back to Fort Bliss, Texas. And from Fort Bliss, Texas, we went to Europe, went to Germany. That's the Signal Corps? Yeah, Signal Corps. And we, uh, I stayed in Germany for 18 months and nine days. And uh, it was pathetic. Uh, we, uh, we was fighting race wars all the time over there. Even in Germany, you had your, you had your black outfits, your white outfits, and you had your black townships and your white townships. You were not allowed in their town, they were not allowed in your town. Oh, is that right? Well, what do you mean black townships and white townships? That were, that were not well, black, black residents. No, it was not black residents, but they're, whatever, like the town I was stationed at, was a cop burn, and uh, the next town was where an outfit was, was Kempton, Germany, and uh, uh, there was an Air Force base in uh, Lance, Lance, no, Lansbury, just a few kilometers away. Right. And uh, so, white outfit over here in this town, black outfit over here in this town. And of course, uh, if you call white boys in your town, they had to pay. They, they, they paid you, it. and they caught you. You paid you. Yes. Um, what was the relationship between the black soldiers and the the inhabitants, the residents of those towns? Oh well, they were they were typically white, uh, and the white soldiers had poisoned their minds. We were supposed to have had tails, and, and then some of the uh, people in the communities that we were doing work through, uh, they would run up and rub your skin, try to rub the dirt off to see if you were just dirty or was this a real part of your skin. So it was, a, it was an interesting experience. And you spent 18 months? In Germany. Mm -hmm. And then after that, what did you do? I came back to the States where I was discharged and uh, stayed in D.C. from 53 to 54, came home, and uh, went to start to college, I went to Niles College and started in June of 54. And you completed Miles, yes. and after you completed Miles, what, what did you do? After, after graduating from Miles, I uh, went to work. I was, got a job with the Birmingham Board of Education as a science teacher uh, at Lane Elementary School, where I taught from 1960 to 66. So you then <clears throat> returned to Birmingham in what, about 56 or 57? 54. 54. And, well, 54 was a monumental year because that's the year that uh, the Brown versus Board of Education decision, right. and then 55, the Montgomery bus for time. Uh, 56, the development of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. All these things All are going these things. on. Same uh, did that have any impact upon what was happening on the campus at Miles at the time? Oh yes, uh, a lot of kids wanted to go down, come downtown to uh, demonstrate, and of course uh, the then we didn't know we didn't know what was happening, and everybody was trying to get on the bandwagon, and they had the the sit-ins and the. Uh, Freedom Riders, and of course we were reading the paper and discussing it in class, and some of the kids from the school came down and got into the uh, uh, sit-ins and what have you, but uh, it was a... Uh, you were older than the average student. Yeah, like that sounds better. Huh? Right. Did that have any, any impact upon the way that you viewed what was taking place versus the way that the younger people viewed? 
I don't really think so. I think uh, we were probably a little bitter because we had been to the military and uh, we, for the life then too, we knew a lot about, we knew more about what was going to happen and the results of what would happen because some of us had experience having gone to jail and stuff like that. We knew the system. Being older, we knew what they could do. And there was literally fear in our hearts because we were taught all our lives, you know, that, uh, hey, this is your place. You stay in your place. What was your reaction to those that were going down to participate? Oh, we, we were really encouraging them. We were very proud. And I think I was probably the one that was uh, too, uh, I was ashamed of myself for not having the guts that some of the other kids had. Mm -hmm. Just I had, having lived longer than them, I had more fear in me. Right. Yes. So you then finished up at, at um, Miles, and you then joined the Birmingham school system to right. spend life. Correct. Right. Elementary school, is that right? Well, That's right. right. And um, in 61, we did have Freedom Ride 62 that was selected by the campaign right. that was initiated really by Miles College students. Mm -hmm. And then in 63, of course, the big demonstration. Big demonstration. Uh, what were you doing at that particular point? Well, at that time, uh, we had no idea that the thing would take off like it did. <clears throat> so we were attending rallies every Monday night, the Alabama Christian Movement. Yeah. There are different churches all over the neighborhood, I mean, the city. We would attend these rallies. And of course, uh, when the kids, uh, when the kids start joining the boycott downtown and marching, uh, it was so sporadic and really we knew as teachers we could not get involved. So what we would do, we had to lock the doors or chains to keep the keep kids in. <clears throat> but we'd go down the ground floor and raise the windows and turn them back like we're looking down the hall. The kids knew what to do. And then I, I was teaching on the second floor and then uh, Kids come to my class, I would threaten them, you know, you mean you, you were here? I got to teach you. <laughs> Trying to get them out of the class and get out there. Because we would be fired if we had participated. So our participation was through the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, were you married at the time? Did you yes, have, I was Did you have children? I had very small children. Okay. They were not, they were not late. Late. too late to that oh, wow. before. Um, but when those kids then returned to school, were there any discussions of what had taken place? Oh, the kids would tell us what was going on. This way we kept in, we watched the news in the afternoon. And uh, uh, the day that they got, so many kids got arrested. We'd drive by the jail, there were so many kids. They just, the jail yard just full. Mm -hmm. Kids from sea to sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was beautiful, it was really beautiful. Uh, you mentioned that you, you attended mass meetings. Oh, how, was, how would you describe the mass meeting? Uh, they would have speakers, Reverend Shuttlesworth would usually uh, have speakers. Dr. King came once, or once or twice, and uh, many uh, movie stars like uh, Harry Belafonte, uh, Sidney Poitier, I remember at 16th, uh, 6th Avenue Baptist Church when it was on 6th Avenue. Yes. Uh, I think uh, Harry Belafonte and several movie stars, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. And uh, we were just, just having a glorious time, almost like a, a revival. People would speak and they would talk. And then there was always the uh, cops in the back, detective, plain clothes detectives. How did you know that they were cops? Oh, well, they were white. <laughs> <laughs> they were white. They couldn't, miss them. they couldn't blend in. They could not blend in. They weren't. They weren't uh, newspaper people, so you knew who they were. Um, during this time, in the in the mid sixties, well, in the six three demonstrations, um, between April first and I guess by May twelfth. Now, in fact, the demonstrations every day. Correct. Uh, did you participate in the demonstrations? 
um, what we on the East Vicinity, I was in the one that marched from downtown to the city jail. What was that like? In, what was the experience like? How would you describe that experience? Where did you start? Uh, uh, I think just I God, I had, I, it's been so long ago. Mm -hmm. All I remember was walking down Sixth Avenue. Mm -hmm. Bang, toward? Toward City Jail. City Jail. Yeah. And the uh, bull counter and the, uh, with his bull horn and all this, excuse me, all this policemen out there and their dogs and stuff like that. So you were, I was really terrified. Mm -hmm. Was that the day that uh, Bull Carter told the fireman to turn the water on? No, that was, that was it. I don't know whether that was before or afterwards. Oh. No, they did not turn the water on us that Sunday, oh. that Easter Sunday. Oh. Um, how many people were involved? Was it a, was it oh, a huge? It was a front. sea of people. It was a sea of people. And were you up front and back? Uh, in the I happened to be up front because we were a friend of mine, we were walking ahead of the crowd. We wanted to see what was going to happen. And uh, so uh, they stopped us and told us, hey, we can't go through. So since there was just two of us, and we were about two blocks ahead of the, the uh, masses, mm -hmm. they just pushed us on out the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we stand over to the side. Okay. And uh, Shuttlesworth and uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth and the others, Oh boy, they were some proud, they were some, I don't know, what's the fearless, who were fearless, they were fearless. Mm -hmm. Reverend, Reverend N.H. Smith and uh, Reverend Porter, oh, these guys were fierce, fearless. Oh. Yeah, they were on the front lines. They were on the front line. Mm -hmm. um, you said that you and the Spring Bureaus were ahead of the... Uh, yeah, we were swimming along. You know, like youngsters, uh, well, we were younger. I was teaching school at the time, mm -hmm. so I couldn't really get involved because that would have meant my job. Right. So you stayed ahead so of I it, so you would not be... Uh, I'm just a part of it. Mm -hmm. I see. What part of the city did you live in? Were you still living in that time? I was living in, on the south side, southwest part of town in Titusville, mm -hmm. on 17th Avenue Southwest. And were there any incidents that you may remember that uh, you or some of your friends may have had problems with the police or with white people? Oh, yes, Lord. Uh, when was it that you didn't have problems with it? Because you, they, they use the N-word constantly. And uh, uh, I remember there was a bombing on Center Street one, I don't know what month or year it was, but my neighbor, he was working 3 to 11 at U.S. Steel. And uh, he drove through Center Street just ahead of the bombing. And of course, uh, when the bomb went off, everybody ran outdoors looking. My neighbor drove up and drove home. And I said, I spoke to him. I said, what was that? He said, I don't know. And uh, we, we turned the TV on. We found out it was, he had just passed there. Hmm. So we was. He went in the house, and I went in the house. Kids was in bed. And this was uh, at night. This was at night after eleven o'clock. Uh, I looked out the window, and there was an army of highway patrolmen on the street that we lived on. And so I called my wife. I said, "Look at here!" And we peeping out the windows, and they they got all kind of weapons. And all I got is a twenty-two rifle. I'm peeping out. We, not, we knew that they had something to do with it. So they went to my neighbor's house. So I'm sitting in the window with my little 22 rifle going to protect him, mm -hmm. I guess, <laughs> you know, how he knew what I was. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they questioned him. They thought maybe he had seen something. Uh, they, what they did, they saw his car and they got his mm -hmm. tag number. Oh, they were thinking that he might have seen them. Mm -hmm. And so they were clear, clearing the way mm -hmm. for what went down. So are you suggesting that they had something to do with the bombing? Oh, most definitely, most definitely. So the, you know, in many cities, um, the there's a slogan on many of the police cars. I haven't seen it on Birmingham police cars, but it says, "We're here to protect and serve." Would that have uh, fit the Birmingham Police Department during that time? No, no. 
they were there to uh, to steal. I mean, they were the biggest thieves. As a matter of fact, my father was a bootlegger. He sold white whiskey, uh, what we used to call, refer to as Joe Lewis. And he was one of the biggest in, the, in Birmingham. And where he used to get his whiskey was from City Hall. He used to go to City Hall and get an escort. And this is uh, before I started teaching when I was in college. I was working for my father to go to school. And uh, when we ran out of whiskey, we went to City Hall. He made a phone call. I go to City Hall, get a little whiskey, and get a police escort home. From City Hall? From City Hall. Same one downtown here. That's interesting. Now, my, father's, heard that. my father's payroll in 1957 to Birmingham Police Department was $10,000 a month. $10,000 a month. That was his payoff to the police to to department to keep him in so he could stay in business. Huh. That's very interesting. And, and he was not uh, alone. Oh, no, by no means. Yeah, well, that's serious. Um, you mentioned that you taught through 1966, that's that right? right. At night, and what did you do after that? I uh, started to work at, uh, I went to work at U.S. as a metallurgist. Uh, they called me and offered me a job. They were recruiting blacks. And of course, uh, I had never made, as a matter of fact, I was going to med school in uh, September that year. And uh, my wife was, being, was a nurse, and we had been struggling. I think my first uh, my first uh, contract I got at home now was three hundred and sixty six dollars and sixty six cents a month for nine months, and I had to pay insurance out of that. Cool. And so you know it was struggling, yeah. and uh, so I went to work for U.S. Steel at six hundred and four dollars a month. That was not counting shift differential, and they was going to pay my insurance. And God, I remember in. After, well, I didn't even know what metal agents was. I went to the dictionary to find out what was metal agents, what was I be doing? Not knowing I was going to be the first black, they didn't tell I was going to be the first black. So uh, I looked it up, science and metal. You know, and so uh, I took the job, went out there, and it was, I paid my dues again. How do you mean you went to the pages? I was the first black, one of the first blacks to walk around with a pen and a pencil, writing. This was my job, processing. I was a process observer, observing the process and making steel. And all I had to do was write it up, et cetera, and write the steel pour's name, who's making the steel, and all of this. And of course, uh, I later learned that I, out in the pen was mightier than the sword. I remember one, one I had to walk up to the steel pour, they didn't have black steel pours, they don't want to have white steel pours. I walked up to steel pour, and I said, what's your name, please? And he looked at me and said, can't you read, damn it? And so I, I, his name is on the back of his jacket. So I wrote, steel pours, can't you read, damn it? And uh, I had the power uh, condemning a heat of steel, uh, approving it. And every, everything that, since they were so nasty, I could be nasty, and the pen was mightier than the sword. And that's what uh, I worked with in my pen. Well, how, how did they, how was your reception then? If you were, uh, they were belligerent and you oh, then were reacted to that, how did that make your, your job? That make your it job was, it was Pure hell, because see, we had to go up to the furnace. There was a little peephole. You look in and see the bath. Just watch steel. It's liquid. It's not liquid. You have to watch for see what you see in there. Whether you see bubbles or a boil or what have you. And uh, they were standing behind you. When you get up to the door, they'd open that door. It'll jump up and steel would jump up. Three three thousand degrees steel would jump out in your lap if you weren't careful. And you got 
you had all kind of stuff that was trying to run over you with the chains and, and you got to run across track. It was scary. It was scary. So your life was in danger. It was constant all, all the time. Matter of fact, when I was going to management, I became a practicing engineer. They sent me to the blast furnace and they hung me in effigy on the number five blast furnace. And you just had, you had to learn to, uh, when you close your car door, you locked all the doors, you took the cellophane and put it across the strip of your door, the strip of your hood. And when you went back to your car, you looked at each piece of cellophane to make sure it wasn't broken. So it was constant fear. You're being the first black man to walk around with the pen, did you then uh, blaze a trail for others to follow? Did others come in after oh, you? Yes, yes. And how long did it take for you then to be accepted as as um, your position to be respected? Uh, I was never. I was out there for twenty five years, and it was never. Is that right? It was never accepted. You Matter mean, of fact, even after I won a lawsuit. They terminated me in 1984, and uh, I went to EEOC and won a lawsuit against them. And I, I was working as a disability examiner for the state of Alabama. At that time, I worked from 85 to 88 as a disability examiner. And I won. You after they had terminated after you? they terminated me. It was the greatest thing ever happened to me. And this was the only job that I had truly loved since I'd been an adult. I enjoyed being a disability exam. When my attorney called me and told me, Mr. Maddox, we just won our case. And I was ecstatic until I got to his office and he told me, you got to go back to work at USD. I cried like a baby. This was the only way I could win the case. And uh, I had to quit my job as a disability exam, go back to work at US Steel. As a, I went back as a military, which is a chemical engineer. And, uh, in September of 88, and then uh, I, reti I retired at night. Did you, before you went over as a metallurgist, had you had any experience that were you taught on the job? On the job. Uh, who taught you? Oh, a uh, white boy. Matter of fact, he's my neighbor. <laughs> uh, Mockley, his name is, how much? Last name is not there. He's present when you left? He's present in my neighbor. Because I remember when I first started working at US Steel, I, when they used to give me nasty remarks, I said, okay, you keep this up, I said, I'll move next door to you. This was after the Fair Housing Act. And not realizing that I was really going to do that in a few years, I was moving next door to him. And so he was, he was fair, he was fair. Matter of fact, he and I talk all the time now. Um, you you talk about the difficulties on that job. How long were you there? I was there for 25 years. 25 years. It was difficult. And it was not one of those jobs where you were excited about going to every day? No, no. I should regurgitate. In the morning when I got up to go to work, I regurgitate. So I forced myself to go out there. Were there other black men? I know there were other black men in the plant, but were there other black men that you interacted with? Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. This is the only way that kept me going. Mm -hmm. The only way that I, I remember when I first went to the blast furnace, the blacks thought that since I was a supervisor, that I could do things that the superintendent couldn't do. And it wasn't that simple. He was still the Superintendent was still my boss, but they thought I could move mountains. And uh, we had to, uh, the way, when I was at Blast Ranch, the way I got, I used to have to bribe the white boys by paying them extra to teach the blacks how to operate machinery. I sent them up in the, way up in the field to let them teach them how to operate machinery. How did you bribe them? What did you mean? Like you had job classes. You work a, a certain job, say a, a mobile operator was a job class six or eight. And uh, 
different classes, and right. they were working a job class five or like four. I'd pay them a job class eight or nine. So you would actually pay them yeah, pay to stamp their card I see. to to teach the uh, blacks. This is blacks. And that's the way that blacks, in many cases, got a chance to move up. Move up. Is by, was that it was clear? Was that done ordinarily by others? I think most of the, well, then we were getting a few black supervisors, and uh, and I was able to promote some blacks. And uh, matter of fact, uh, I have uh, one of my uh, uh, proteges, uh, he's, uh, he, uh, he's probably the highest paid black out of the U.S. deal right now. And uh, he's a general supervisor. But it was hook and crook. Mm -hmm. You did what you could. You slipped this and you slipped that. And, uh, was the union active out there? Oh, very. Do you remember? No. I was, was a member of, uh, I was a member of, for a while, when I first went out there, I was a member of the Office and Technical Workers Union. Uh, I forget the number of it. I was never uh, in the steel, United right. States steel. Right. right. Because you were in management. So no, I was in technical work. Technical work. So when I first was hired, then I was promoted to management. Right. After about three years. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we were non union. Right. How did the, the movement impact upon work in Berkeley? <clears throat> Obviously, it had a great deal of impact because I would not have been working at U.S. Steel, not as a metal agent, uh, and certainly not as a supervisor, a chemical engineer. Uh, I remember there was the night that Dr. King was assassinated. I was working in 11 to 7, and uh, oh man, I was, I was on the open hop floor. And you would have thought it was the 4th of July. I mean, if I'm the only black up there with inequality. And uh, I mean, those white people, man, they shout like, like uh, we just won a war. How did you feel? Oh, I felt about I was angry. Then I saw for myself. You start looking at people, you know who's your friend, who's not your friend. Mm -hmm. And you just you become more, more than intellect. Mm -hmm. You know how to treat them. Right. And so it was. What about other black men that night? Were they uh, impacted upon? That them? night was so. Uh, I really don't know because I had. Matter of fact, I had to. Most of my dealings were white, because white was in authority, and I dealt with the authority figures. And uh, so the white blacks was mostly laborers. So I didn't have any, except this passing conversation, you know, like they don't break or something. Right. But I had very little interaction with them, because we were busy all night, all the time, every, uh, and late hour shift, we make, I think we was making like maybe eight, let's see, nine or ten heaps a night. That was an awful lot of heaps. Now you make it. To, I think our best time was six hours for a real heat. What do you mean a heat? That's a batch of metal for uh, for a certain type of steel. Different, like this, all of this metal here. You see, if that's metal. That would be aluminum deep draw. So you make a specific heat for this type because you can draw it and uh, shape it. And this is the, the beauty of making steel. And it's beautiful to make steel. But uh, I guess this was what kept me going. I was learning so much so rapidly. Right. And uh, but now you can make a heat in uh, 150 tons of steel and 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. So technology is just technology is just off. taking off. Mm -hmm. We had we had three blast furnaces when I first started at Fairfield. Now they have one, and uh, you can 
You know, so I make steel and I make steel, then they send it to make iron, make steel, back to make iron. And uh, it was fascinating. It's fascinating, just the uh, difference. Like you blow, you blow hot air into a blast furnace to smelt the uh, uh, scrap, the uh, gravel, the dolomite, limestone to make steel. Uh, you make steel, they blow it in like 100,000 PSI now. That's a lot of pressure. Or, or when the old, for instance, we are blowing in like 20, 30,000. Whole new day. A whole new world. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened to me, see, when I went back, the reason I was wanting to retire, I was, as a disability examiner, I had my own office, my own secretary, and uh, so I was off from, from USC from 84 to uh, 88. Everything at USC was now is computerized. And uh, the guys that uh, who stayed out there, they went to computer school. I didn't. And I was computer terrorized. I mean, I was computer illiterate and it scared me to death. Yeah. And so I, I wanted out. I wanted out. And uh, my job when I got back from suing them and wearing my suit, they sent me to the blast, back to the blast room, after sending me to the Cuba was to sit and do nothing for eight hours a day. Oh, sit and do nothing. And that was the hardest job I've ever had in my life. You would sit and do nothing. Sit and do anything. Didn't have, have, sit didn't really have a job. Didn't have a job, just be there. Mm -hmm. So that was that was your punishment. That was my punishment. Was there any way for you to, to deal with that? Oh was yeah, I see. I see well. Leap, drive out of the gate, go up to the mall, shop, walk around. And one night I was coming back and I had a thought. I said, Louise, I said, what if something happened while you're out? You're playing into their hand. You're doing exactly what they want you to do. I said, I, said, I get back in this plant, I'm going to do this. I go back to the plant and I remembered I had to. I had several kind of cases when I was a disability exam, but I never had a skin case. And I had my book there with me at work. Now, I, I flipped. I knew I had psoriasis of the feet. I flipped the skin disease, skin disorders. And I read, so oh my Lord, I said, I've been retired eight years ago. There was my diagnosis. So I'm disabled. Just that uh, before you. Just before me. And you just determined. I'm just, I came home from work that night. I told my wife, I thought I'd swallow on vacation in November. I'm not going back to work. She said, she said what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to retire. I said, I'm going to call the employment office in the morning and see how much money I would get. And uh, I did that. I did. I called the employment. I said, if I came off on disability, how much would I get? It's 50% of your salary. My God. So that's it. I said, I won't be going back after November. So I came up in November of 89, having five months of sick leave. So I wrote that until May. Then I was on disability. And did you do any other kind of work after you? No, my, my, my psoriasis was so bad I couldn't walk. Was that right? I, I could not walk. I could wear shoes. So you've been retired now for six years? For six years. Have you enjoyed it? Oh, tremendously. You, you, don't, you never miss U.S. Steel? God, when I drive, when I go to Bassmore, I look the other way. I don't even look at U.S. Steel. I hate that place with a passion. I really, I despise it. Because it was 25 years of pure hell. Mm. That's a, a good uh, title for a book, 25 Years of Pure Hell. I've been trying to, I've been trying to get the courage up to write a book. Yeah. 
but it was 25 years of PYR. So, Ms. Matz, I really want to thank you for the time that you spent with me today to just talk about your experiences in the movement as well as uh, as a worker. And maybe sometime we'll have the opportunity to sit down and, and, and dig a little bit deeper into your story. I certainly enjoyed talking with you about it. Thank you. And I hope I've been some benefit to you. You certainly have. Thank you very much.